And when it comes to validity and reliability, you'll notice in lots of different research methods books, they talk about different qualities of research. So um, validity is seen here as the extent to which the data and their interpretation are credible. So when, it, when I went back to that one about the problems of sexuality for ginger people, the data was saying one thing, but if I'd gone along with that, I wouldn't have been credible in my interpretation. And another famous um, author for research methods books is Creswell, who talks about how our studies need to be trustworthy. They need to be defend, uh, dependable, confirmable, and credible. Okay, so really important. And it may be that when you're writing up your methods chapter, you might even have words like this in. So find a reference, use reference as well, but show how this study is trustworthy, dependable. Um, it confirms exactly the data and the interpretation are credible. And that's how you're guaranteeing that your work here is uh, um, uh, tr trustworthy from a research perspective. Denzin and Lincoln, again, two great names in research methods. So well worth looking at some of the publications that they've done, especially when it comes to qualitative research. Look at the bit showing up here in Cream, where they say that somehow we have lost the human and passionate element of research by insisting on a trinity of credibility, which means validity, generalizability and reliability. So they're starting to question some of the uh, often taken for granted terms within research methods and research method studies, especially when it comes to this term generalizability, that would only be a claim made of quantitative research. So for if your study is purely qualitative, never bother saying that this is um, that this study isn't generalizable because everyone knows uh, qualitative research doesn't make that claim. And here's the slide I showed you earlier for making sure that you're being contextual. So describe the stuff, explore it, look at motivations, origins, um, how things work, assessing their impact. All of these are going to be really uh, informative for you to generate new ideas, maybe even generate new studies that you can then go on uh, if you are planning on doing doctoral work. So here's another opportunity for us to pause and do an exercise on this. You could ask yourself what types of knowledge are generally known um, about the particular field of practice or the, the, the research interest that you've got at the moment. Um, look at the papers that have been written on this. What sort of research studies have been done on your topic before um, and which uh, genre or which perspective have they come from? So what types of knowledge are generally known about this? But then what are your systems of thought? How do you generally think about this particular topic? So if it's something like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, say domestic violence and abuse, so you might say, oh, well, in the past, I've only read um, quantitative studies on this. So I know the number of people um, that, that, that are counted within these statistics. But then you ask yourself, well, and who's not counted? But then you ask even more questions. Why are they not counted? What could we do about counting them? So these are your systems of thought. You start thinking about all the lateral ways that you may understand your topic even better. And then when you go back to what Richie said in 2003, um, how can you make this con contextually relevant? Um, what wide and deep descriptions are you going to have to explain all of this? Um, What's the impact on your evaluation? How are you now shedding different light? Go back to that crystal and you're thinking of all the different ways in which people have thought about this. You're bringing them together in your study. And now what you're looking at is totally new, dynamic and changing. And that's how you're generating new ideas and new ways to think about the particular topic area. So let's focus back on you again. When it comes to doing your study, um, why are you doing it? And has exploring some um, interpretivist um, ideas in this study year given you different ways to think of it and to explore what it is you're going to be looking at? 
because qualitative research is a really powerful tool for actually having um, a positive impact on life improvements for individuals, whether that's raising their voice, raising their profile, empowerment, it's a new way of looking, but it's transformative at the same time. Some of the richness about this is that you're dealing with human experiences. This is not laboratory testing of things. You're looking at real lived experience. You're looking at the different meanings, not only that your participants will give to this, but you as the researcher. So meanings and understandings as well. And especially when people are coming from many, many different ways with different perspectives on a various uh, topic that you're looking at, it's going to give you new understandings. One other funny little um, uh, sentence that somebody came out with um, as part of my own doctoral research those years ago was uh, in, in talking about sex, look at the ways in which people don't talk about it, the ways in which it's hidden, sort of ochi, under voice, uh, it's, it's hidden and buried. And she was a registered nurse who said that when she did her registered nurse um, education for three years, when she did that, there was nothing at all mentioned about sex or sexual health. She said the only one reference that ever came out about this was from her sister tutor, as they used to be called in those days. And the sister tutor just said that if ever they were going to give a young man a bed bath and they pulled back the sheets and he had an erection, then just flick it with their pencil. And she said in the three years, that's all they were ever taught about anything to do with sex at all. So qualitative research is going to be looking out for those things that aren't spoken about, the things that are hidden or difficult to speak about. It's giving you voice to um, many ways in which life is not expressed. When it comes to justifying your paradigm, and uh, uh, especially when you're doing your research proposal, look at what others have done on it. And one of the databases well worth looking at is something called the British and Irish Index of Theses. And that's every doctoral study or every master philosophy that's been written in Britain and Ireland on particular topics. And especially when you're going on to do doctoral studies, it's important to have a look at that database. So the, the British and Irish index of theses, okay? See what other people have done on it because you want to bring something new to it. You're not just going to replicate what they've done. You're looking at it from totally different perspectives and therefore you need to see, well, how far did they go and how much further can I take this on, okay? Or it may mean that you're going to explore one dimension of the, something that somebody else has done. Look at their methods and findings. What have they left unsaid? And it may be that you go straight to the section of somebody's thesis and have a look at the back saying limitations. See what they considered were the limitations. And that usually means what they couldn't do, what they didn't have time to do, or what they might have done differently had they thought about this beforehand. And also look at the various literature, especially on epistemologies and ontologies, and become really well versed in methodologies and methods. So here, as we're moving towards the end now, here's Creswell suggesting eight key strategies. You need prolonged engagement. This isn't a quick one-off situation. If it's qualitative research, you need to be um, embedded within the stuff that you're looking at. Make sure it's rich, thick, and descriptive data. You don't just want simple answers, tick box answers. You know, do you believe in this? Don't you believe in that? It's not that. It's why do you believe this way? It's looking at rich, thick, and descriptive. Whether you're talking about triangulation, crystallization, um, or kaleidoscopy, look at ways of gathering your data in different ways. So obviously one way will be from stuff that's already published on this. So your research, uh, your literature review is going to be really important here. Also check out the researchers' understandings with the participants. So like with that story I just told you about uh, the problems of sexuality and gender for people. What I could have done is to send the transcript back to all the people in that particular group to ask them to read through it, to check that I was being trustworthy in the way I'd heard what they were saying. And someone could have written back to me then and said, well, David, no, you've got that wrong. I didn't say that. And then they could have corrected me. So quite often you need to go back to your participants uh, to get them to see what you've transcribed, to check out the meanings of this. Anything that you're not sure on, so 
<laughs> that uh, problems of sexuality for ginger people, clarify discrepant inflammation, but also explore your own particular bias. And that could be even from your starting point, are you focusing on just one group of people? And if so, why are you focusing on them and not on somebody else? So is there bias right from the very beginning? What about the categories you use? So the HIV statistics example I gave you, there was bias in putting people into certain pigeonholes. OK, um, peer debriefing. Yes, certainly uh, on your course. Talk to each other about it. Give opportunities for sharing all of your information as well. Don't just keep this to yourself, but share this maybe in tutorials or seminars. Share your ideas with others and um, certainly the external auditor means us as the markers. So we're going to be making sure that your work is valuable and trustworthy but we're going to be looking at it and giving you feedback and comment as well and right towards the end now how are you going to water all of this how are you going to feed it and make it grow creswell suggests um, five key qualitative research traditions so sometimes it may be biography you may be writing a story your dissertation may be a story about an individual or individuals, about societies, uh, peoples. It could be that you're ex exploring various types of phenomena and trying to understand those. So when I mentioned about victims, survivors, thrivers, uh, what's the difference between those? It could be a specific uh, methodology called grounded theory, which I haven't covered here, but obviously that's going to be great for you to look up uh, grounded theory and ask whether that's the suitable approach for you to take. Ethnography is literally writing about peoples, okay? And uh, finally, you could be doing a particular case study. So it may be um, uh, a particular area, geographical area, and you're going to look at it from all different perspectives. So health, poverty, education. So a case study involves lots of dimensions of looking at, this, uh, um, at a particular uh, phenomenon or people. And here's the final part of this presentation. With quantitative researchers, um, so scientific, uh, biomedical researchers, when they write up their research studies, there are always certain um, uh, certain elements of a paper that must be written. And when they get sent off to these uh, international and national journals, it would be expected that they cover a whole load of particular um, dimensions of their research paper. Unfortunately, with qualitative research, there hasn't always been that rigor. So you may look at different qualitative research uh, journals and you might find that the quality of the reporting of the study isn't quite as good as you'd find in other studies. So um, Tong et al came out with this COREC checklist, which is 32 different items that when you're writing up your research, you should try to get these 32 different items in. And if you mention these, if you manage to get all of these in, then you're making the reporting of qualitative research as sort of scientifically rigorous as natural science would be, okay? So you don't just write it off um, uh, without paying attention to this, because even then when you're st starting to analyze other people's research, and maybe you're using the CASP tools, CASP tools are asking you to check out for certain things. So this correct system here is showing 32 items that it's really good to try to include these somehow, or as many as possible, into the reporting of your qualitative research to give it extra um, um, academic credibility. Okay, thanks for listening to all of this. Bye-bye.